faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Resilient. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Hey guys, Jared Moon here and welcome to the Better Humanology podcast. This week, we have Dr. Anthony J and we cover some really awesome stuff. Now, he is currently at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, researching stem cells and epigenetics. If you don't know what epigenetics are, then you absolutely have to stay around for this entire episode because it's really, really impressive stuff. Now, in addition, he is also leads the AJ Consulting Group and he's the best-selling author, author of Estro generation. So what do we talk about today? We talk a lot about his, uh, about DNA. DNA consulting is a big part of what he does now. And we get into epigenetics. And what's so interesting about epigenetics is you've probably heard, uh, this runs in my family or, you know, this, that, or the other, I'm prone to this. And while some of that has maybe a little bit of truth to it, we're starting to find out through a lot of different research and, and testing and epigenetics and in this field that is not completely true. You can actually change your genes uh, through exercise, through deadlifting, through eating healthier. You can change what the next generation of your family looks like by making smarter, healthier decisions now. That's a big part of what, about what we talk about today. The kind of stuff that blows me away that we're even learning about. So stick around for that. Also, we talk about testosterone if you're a dude who's, uh, I don't know, over over 40 years old and you've heard the whole, you know, well, my testosterone's low, just kind of comes with age. Well, Dr. J kind of points out that that's not really true. And the reason why testosterone levels are the lowest they've been in decades, at least, you know, I mean, all across, across the world, what's happening to testosterone levels and how we can fix it. So Dr. J is really awesome because he loves all this stuff and he loves to deadlift. So without any further ado, let's talk to Dr. Anthony J. All right, Dr. J, welcome to the Better Humanology podcast, man. I'm pumped to have you on. Thanks for having me. Pumped to be here. <laughs> yeah, so let's uh, let's get started with some challenges and some recommendations for everybody listening. So if you could get us started with a fitness challenge. Well, I mean, I'm not sure of your audience, but if they're not deadlifting already, everyone <laughs> should be everyone should be deadlifting. <laughs> and you know, I recommend people try and do the hex bar deadlift. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of pro athletes are doing it. Baseball players. I was just with the Minnesota Twins pitching staff this weekend and this past weekend, and we were doing uh, some some training videos and things. And the hex bar deadlift is really efficient for people in that situation because, you know, you can do deadlifting and squatting, mm -hmm. but a lot of these guys, they prefer just to do the hex bar because you're activating your quads a lot more. So, you know, just it's, I think it's really valuable to change it up once in a while. I mean, I, I oftentimes, you know, do both the deadlift and the squat in my training programs, but you know, every once in a while I like to do that hex bar and it's, it's, it's a beneficial exercise for efficiency. Yeah. And that's, it's been gaining a ton, a ton of popularity, even with some of the top strength and condi conditioning coaches out there has me a little fearful that the conventional deadlift may be on its way out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I hope not, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and, and, and there's a place for doing both, but you know, sometimes when you're doing, say, say you're adding five pounds per week or something like that, or, or per, you know, five or 10 pounds, depending on what exercise movement you're doing, like a deadlift. Um, you know, if you're, if you're deadlifting and then you're squatting and then you're deadlifting and then you're squatting, you know, you're not going to be able to progress quite as rapidly, but if you're just doing a hex bar, you can oftentimes do it twice a week and, and keep adding more uh, weight to it. So you, you seem to, you know, uh, more rapidly move forward in the progression. And that's, that's one of the real benefits I see with it. Yeah. And it's a, it's a great piece of equipment. And I, I challenge, I, I second your challenge to everyone listening to deadlift in some way, shape, or form. If you're if you're not already, I'd I'd hope that a lot of them are. But uh, I think that's a great great challenge. All right, how about a uh, mental toughness challenge? Mental toughness challenge. Hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I don't have anything specific, but I uh, I do a YouTube video uh, every week on Thursdays with uh, you know original scientific 
research and it's not a highly produced video. It's is in fact, there's basically no editing. And, you know, I, I, I challenge people to watch some of those videos on specific topics like testosterone or, you know, avoiding artificial red food coloring or whatever, whatever the specific thing is. I have a lot of them about regarding artificial estrogen chemicals because that's what my book is about. And, you know, even though it's not super exciting and there's not a lot of video editing and a lot of action, you know, I challenge people to watch some of those because they're purely, they're free and they're purely just to show people what the scientific research says on specific topics. And they're, they're palatable. They're not made to be really technical, but they'll definitely challenge your mind and the way you think about, I don't know, things like saunas and things like cold water immersion. And, you know, I, tr I try not to just show people what everybody is saying, but what the, what the newest scientific research is saying. And sometimes there's discrepancy there. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and especially with testosterone, I've been doing some on testosterone lately and let me give you an example, right? So, um, I just learned, I was doing research on just all things testosterone. Number one, I learned that age declines in testosterone. You know how you always hear, you know, as you get past age 40, you just steadily decline, your testosterone level steadily declines. Yeah. That's not actually true. Oh, nice. That's a, yeah, that's shocking that's a to me. huge I mean, win for everyone over 40 right there. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, there's, there's more variability. So you do find people at older ages sometimes with really, really extremely low, uh, testosterone and that brings the curve down. But as, as a general rule, if you get rid of those few outliers, the testosterone doesn't decline as we age. And I mean, that blew my mind because that's not something you hear. I mean, if you just Google you know, testosterone declines with age, you'll get a million different graphs on Google images, but most of them are just made up. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look up the references, they're not even referencing scientific papers that suggest that. So again, mind blowing. But here's the other component of that is that we, as a culture, our testosterone is declining. So in the last 50 years, our testosterone has declined almost double, which is insane. So I'm not saying we don't have low testosterone. I'm just saying as we age, our testosterone isn't declining. So we do have a low testosterone problem, but it's not the way people think of it. Now, why do you think that as a population, our testosterone levels are decreasing? Because of artificial estrogen. I mean, there's a lot of factors. There's certainly factors involved in nutrition and micronutrients, but, and gut bacteria too. I'm, I'm going to do a video this week on the impact of gut bacteria and testosterone, which is another thing that's kind of surprised me. Um, if you inject people or mice or rats with a substance called lipopolysaccharide, which is usually abbreviated LPS, and that's an indicator of bad gut bacteria, you know, bad gut bacteria secrete this substance, this LPS. If, but if, if you inject that into people, their testosterone drops. And again, mice also. Um, and that's really telling. And what that means is if you have crappy gut bacteria, your testosterone is dropping just from your bad gut bacteria. But I think the, the biggest factor is the artificial estrogen chemicals because they've just been rising and rising as our testosterone has been declining and declining. And what I mean by artificial estrogens are things like soy, you know, well, that's not artificial, that's natural, but you know, the, the prevalence of soy and then all of these chemicals like parabens and phthalates and BPA and you know, even when we have these BPA free products, they still put BPS, bisphenol S in them. And, and that's just as estrogenic as BPA. That's why BPA is bad, by the way. It's because it acts like estrogen in your body. And so I think that's the root cause of most of the testosterone issues. Although people, people should be lifting heavy weights too. That brings it up. Awesome, man. I'm, we're only five minutes in. I'm absolutely loving this conversation. Uh, I'm going to get a book recommendation out of you. Then we're going to circle back to some of these topics, if that's all right with you. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so how about a book recommendation? Something that uh, yeah may have impacted your life after having read it or maybe something you're just currently reading? Yeah, there's so many of them. Uh, I mean, I, I literally try and read a book per week. Usually it's on audio book, but I consider that reading. <laughs> that counts. Yeah, and, that's how I yeah, do it too. And, and the, probably the most recent one I read that... I was really impressed with, and a lot of people have been, is uh, it's called Tripping Over the Truth. I don't know if you've heard of this one, but uh, it's about the metabolic theory of cancer. And I mean, I can summarize it. Yeah, give me a summary. Pretty, it sounds pretty, pretty awesome. Pretty quick, unless, yeah, unless one of your guests has just had it on. <laughs> no, no, I want to hear about it. 
Yeah, well, the, you know, I'm a biochemist. I have a PhD in biochemistry, so I have a lot of familiar familiarity with these pathways, like like glycolysis and and the citric acid cycle and the you know the Krebs cycle. Like basically, how metabolism works is my specialty technically, and that's kind of broad. But you know, I get real interested in metabolism, and you know, when you're trained as a scientist or as a doctor, they teach you about something called the Warburg effect. And what that is, is that's, that's effectively just describing the fact that cancer cells burn sugar. You know, if you've got a cancer, it pretty much burns sugar as energy, glucose as energy, which, you know, nobody really understands. I mean, that's been known since forever, since like the 1920s, probably. And we just don't really, you know, we just kind of push that aside and say, yeah, there's this Warburg effect. We don't understand it. And then they move on to teach you about how genetic mutations are the cause of cancer. But the tripping over the truth book, he does a really nice job of explaining, look, when you burn sugar, that happens outside of the mitochondria. Most people don't realize that. In fact, I didn't even pick up on that. And this is basically my training. I mean, that's my point in saying, look, I'm a metabolic expert and I missed this point. So when your glucose comes into a cell, it gets burned down to pyruvate and then that gets shuttled into the mitochondria and then you get this thing called the citric acid cycle in conjunction with oxygen and you make a ton of energy in the form of ATP. But out, you can do that without the mitochondria and just burn uh, pyruvate and then lactic acid. So you can you know, effectively shut your mitochondria off and that's what cancer cells are doing. They're turning their mitochondria off and just creating a bunch of lactic acid and just burning sugar real fast. And, and I think that the take home message in the book, something that people can utilize is that fat, when you burn fat, only the mitochondria can do that. You can't burn fat the way you burn sugar outside of the mitochondria. You have to utilize oxygen. And just to give you some numbers, you know, if you burn sugar and then you create lactic acid outside of the mitochondria, you get a couple ATPs. And that's again, a form of energy. But if you, sh if you shoot pyruvate into the mitochondria and you use oxygen, you get about 36 ATPs. And if you burn fat for energy, which again is only in the mitochondria, you get about a hundred ATPs. So it's a real efficient way of making energy. And it's a way to starve cancer, frankly, because, you know, again, as scientists, we all know that cancer cells burn sugar. And so if you don't give them sugar and you only feed your cells fat, you have to utilize your mitochondria to make energy and those cancer cells are screwed. <laughs> that's, uh, that's awesome, man. And that, would that make you a proponent of, uh, maybe a ketogenic diet or at least a low carbohydrate diet? Yeah, for sure. Especially if you have cancer. I mean, there, now there are a couple forms of cancer that, that actually burn fat for fuel, like a glioma or something in your brain. And that, that's really rare. And then there are some rare tumors that are genetically passed on. So like the BRCA1 gene or something. Um, about 10% of cancers are, in fact, genetically inherited. Um, but most of them are a m metabolic disorder. And yeah, once you have cancer, you definitely should be looking at a keto diet. That's incredible. I mean, look, just putting that uh, bit of information in your, your fitness toolbox, uh, everyone listening for the unfortunate case in which maybe you you get cancer maybe someone in your family that's that's incredible information to have and uh all of this is laid out in the book tripping over the truth correct yeah i'm gonna check it out and it's simple to read you know i may i probably made it way more complicated than it needed to be <laughs> no yeah i think uh i'm gonna check it out it sounds sounds really good all it right it is yeah all right so let's go back to uh estrogen uh, he, yep. you know, a, a specific question of why do we have some, uh, why do we have as a population lower testosterone levels than we once did? And your immediate answer was estrogen. Uh, and, and I would love to, to dive into that a little bit more, maybe things, uh, you know, people should keep in mind with their own estrogen levels and, and maybe start with a broad understanding of what estrogen does in the body. Yeah. So natural estrogen in men, you know, one of the things people, most, most people don't realize in men, we have, we have natural testosterone. We have some, uh, excuse me, we have estrogen. We have some estrogen and it's about 20 nanograms per liter. Um, and in women, they also have about 20 nanograms per liter up to about 400, depending on the time of the month. So really the range isn't that crazy. It's not that different. 
you know, most people, if you were to ask them what the difference, you know, how much, t- how much estrogen women have, they would probably guess in the thousands of nanograms per liter <laughs> or they wouldn't have any clue, but they would certainly guess that it's massively different than men. But again, between 20 and 400 for women, men have about 20 nanograms per liter. So we have a certain level of natural estrogen. And what's interesting about estrogen and testosterone is similar is that we have receptors all throughout our body. So, you know, like for leptin, for example, which is another hormone, um, you know, most, most of your cells in your body don't have leptin receptors, so they don't pick up leptin. So if you have, you know, your fat cells secrete leptin after you eat, it goes into your blood and just starts cruising around your blood and say it goes into your liver and then it comes out of your liver and there's nothing there to pick it up. It goes into your, you know, pancreas, whatever it comes in, comes out. But when it gets to your brain, you have leptin receptors in the brain. So it sticks in there, tells your body you're satiated, you know, it communicates you should stop eating. That's what leptin does. But estrogen is unique because when it gets into your liver, there's estrogen receptors in your liver, so it sticks there. When it gets into your muscles, there's estrogen receptors in your muscles, so it sticks there. You know what I mean? There's estrogen receptors all throughout your body, so you have a really big impact when you have too much estrogen, whether that's natural estrogen or artificial estrogen. Wow. And what is it in our daily you know, diets, routines, where we're maybe getting it where we shouldn't be? Yeah. Well, in my book, Astro Generation, I talk about, I, I created a top 10 list. And what I tried to do is, yeah, you can find random ones like Agent Orange. You know, that's one of the reasons <laughs> yeah. Agent Orange is so bad is it acts like estrogen. It screws with your estrogen system. Um, and what, by the way, as an aside, one of the reasons we didn't, you know, when Agent Orange was first produced, it was made, it was created as a herbicide to kill plants. Right. And we didn't think it was that bad for people because the effects aren't that immediate, you know, because it acts like these natural hormones in your body. You don't see an immediate effect. So they thought, oh, it's not bad for you. And that's similar with a lot of these other chemicals that I so but but the top 10 list I created is about the daily exposures, you know, stuff that people are literally being exposed to every day, unlike Agent Orange or something like that. And and I think a big one is a big one that people overlook is called atrazine and that's a herbicide. It's the second most used herbicide in North America and it's totally illegal in Europe. And by the way, a lot of these are on my top 10 list. Um, a huge amount of these are totally illegal in Europe, but you find them every single day in, in, in American products and you find atrazine. So roundup is the number one used herbicide. Roundup is glyphosate as the number one used herbicide in North America. Number two is atrazine. And again, estrogenic, it literally causes, you know, in, in lab experiments, in animal models, it causes something called feminization of males. So in a bunch of different ways, it changes males into females because it's acting like estrogen. And the drinking water, the legal limit in the drinking water is 3,000 nanograms per liter uh, for atrazine. And again, in Europe, totally illegal. Zero is allowed in the drinking water. So that's one that I think people are being exposed to if they live in farm country because of the spraying, but also because they're eating corn chips and things like that that are not organic. Super easy to avoid it by just simply filtering your water and eating organic corn if you're eating corn products. But you do have to be aware, you know what I mean? And those would be the two main sources that people probably encounter. It would be their their drinking water if unfiltered. And uh, would it just be specifically corn products or just, uh, you know, really any produce? Yeah, well, Grain. just gra- grains are the big one for atrazine. Okay. Um, and and again, you know, if you buy them organic, you don't have atrazine spray. And corn is the biggest one. I think they spray the most. They spray corn with atrazine more than other grains. But again, that's just number one. You know, that's just one item on the top ten list. So there's a lot of things that people can look for. But that one's a big one, I think, and and nobody's talking about it. So I like to bring it up. That's. Uh, I really appreciate that. Now. You don't have to go through all 10, and I I do highly recommend anyone uh, listening go check out Dr. J's book, but uh, what would be maybe one or two more that we could could be aware of? Yeah, for sure. Um, You know, mycoestrogen is another one. I mean, just speaking of grains, and, you know, people have heard of mycotoxin, which means mold toxin, so anything that mold secrete that's toxic. And a lot of people don't realize one of the reasons mold is so problematic, you know, if you've got mold in your basement or mold behind your sink or whatever, 
it's the reason people put hazmat suits on to, to remediate that is because mold secretes a chemical called xerolinone. And I know it's a wacky name. Z-E-A is how we abbreviate it as scientists. But xerolinone acts like estrogen in your body. So molds, we, ca- we call it the mycoestrogen. So molds are secreting estrogens. And that probably wouldn't be a big problem because most people hopefully don't have a lot of mold in their house. But the problem is, is we're storing grains in these mass facilities. So these big silos and these, you know, the, we're, we're, we're increasing our production and storage and we're increasing the legal limits of mold in a lot of our products, especially in America. And, you know, so it, this mold estrogen is kind of a hidden source of estrogen and it's causing a lot of health problems. I mean, they're all the same health problems. You know, you get the, uh, you get depression, you get weight gains because your body thinks it's pregnant. You know, so you're storing fat for energy. You get lower testosterone, like we talked about. You see a lot more breast cancer. I mean, breast cancer is up 250 percent since 1980. Wow. And you know, I mean, raising awareness with the pink ribbons just isn't <laughs> isn't really solving anything. Most people just need to get these artificial estrogens out of their life. You know. And I've heard a lot of uh, lotions, uh, like over the counter type stuff, that you can get uh, can can raise your estrogen levels as well. For sure. And, and that's where the parabens come in. There's a whole family of chemicals called parabens. So you, you get methylparaben, propylparaben, butylparaben, all these different parabens. And, and there's also these sunscreen chemicals that make my top 10 list. They're called, uh, you know, benzophenones. So oxybenzone is one of the benzophenones. Um, and again, totally illegal in Europe, most of these chemicals. <laughs> and yeah, we're getting them on our, we're, we've got them in our hand soap. We've got them in our our sunscreen, you know, and they go through the skin. They, they, they act like testosterone or something. If you rub testosterone on your skin, you know, it goes right through, no problem. And so do these artificial estrogens. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, I, I, sometimes Europe, you know, is ahead of the curve on these things. And I don't know what it is about, you know, our economy or corporate America, whatever that's affecting it, won't allow us to make the big dramatic changes that other you know, nations are making because it's important. It's imperative to the health of their citizens. But uh, we just have some too much like red tape or I don't know, you know, whatever yeah, you want yeah. to call it, capitalism, whatever's affecting us. I mean, we're all capitalist societies for the most part, but uh, something's not right. There's, yeah. Well, there's a lot more political. There's a lot more influence of money in our political system. And I, I actually ate lunch with a guy named Michael Skinner, Dr. Michael Skinner from, uh, I don't know, Oregon or Washington. And he he gave a TED talk on uh, epigenetic inheritance of, of disease, which basically means if, if you're exposed to chemicals, you, you know, it, yeah, it impacts your health, it harms you, but it, you also pass that on to future generations. And that's kind of one of the main purposes. One of the main reasons I wrote my book is because, you know, that's what these artificial estrogens really do is they really screw up future generations. And that's something we're not, we're barely studying, but it's a huge impact. It gets worse in future, future generations actually. <clears throat> excuse me, but what Michael Skinner, he was saying, so he gave a talk and by the way, just to, just to kind of explain who he is, he wrote a paper. He's one of the discoverers of epigenetic inheritance of disease. So passing on disease from, from your own exposures. He wrote a paper in, I don't know, mid two thousands about, uh, d- about his discovery of this. And it was the most cited science research paper, um, for like five years straight. Wow. Yeah, but among all these different, you know, among all the scientific research papers. So a huge, huge finding, really famous scientist in his own right, but he doesn't like get out and do podcasts and, you know, he's, he kind of does his own little research thing. But he was telling me he gave a talk in Europe about, uh, one of these fungicide chemicals, um, and, and how it causes, you know, yeah, it causes a little bit of health problems when you're exposed to it, but it causes major health problems in your children and their children. And they instantly, like the next week they made that chemical illegal in Europe. Wow. So they have huge, you know, like really good reaction time. Whereas, you know, in America it's still legal and we know all, we know a lot more problems with it, but yeah, there's money, there's corporate influence, you know, buying out these politicians, frankly. Now let's go back to the the mold problem because uh, a lot of people might have, you know, mold issues in their home that they're not aware of. Is this something that you recommend people get tested, uh, either air quality or certain areas of their home tested to see if they have mold? Uh, what do you recommend there? 
Yeah, I mean, usually you can kind of tell, you know, if you've got a damp basement and and it's got old drywall or something that you don't know what's behind it. You know, I mean, if if you have kind of sketchy areas in your house, definitely you should get it checked. I mean, if your house, you know, if you're if you're really confident, you know, you've done renovations, you've seen the backsides of walls, you don't have you have good quality plumbing, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I'd worry more about it in the food, like the grains that you're buying. And, you know, and, and, and try not to get these mass produced grain products, like, you know, like just a normal, like you find in normal breads and normal, whatever, you know, pizzas and that sort of thing. And is that what, uh, I mean, the best defense against mold in food, would you say is just avoidance? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. And now one other topic I wanted to, to hop into, uh, is, your work with DNA Consulting. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and, and what you're doing? Yeah, for sure. It's uh, it's pretty fun, actually. I I, en- I enjoy talking to people about, you know, customizing their athleticism. I mean, that's one of the reasons I work with professional athletes. Or you know, str- I was doing some stuff with a strongman competitor recently, and you know, high end elite performers, but also normal people that just want to get healthy or improve their health. Because, you know, I mean. We, sometimes powerlifting is the ideal, you know, training program for somebody, for most people, actually, for, for a lot of people. But then sometimes endurance is the ideal way to go or sometimes high intensity interval training or and, and it's similar with the diet. You know, sometimes people, you know, are really poor adapters to keto, you know, keto, a keto diet, like going into ketosis is really difficult for them and it's not that beneficial. Whereas other people, it's unbelievable. Now you see the carnivore diet popping up and right. some people respond amazing to that. And some people it's, you know, it's mediocre at best. And, you know, it goes back to your DNA. And, and you know, that's what I try and help people with is let's look at it. And one of the big focuses that I have is on detoxing and detox genes, which get a bad rap because people kind of use that term for everything. Yeah. But, you know, there's reality there. There's like, for example, in your liver, if you if you get exposed to aluminum, your liver has enzymes that break, you know, that clear aluminum from your body that help you get it out of your body. And aluminum can be real neurotoxic. It can build up in your body. It can screw up your nerves. So you don't want aluminum, for example. And, you know, some people have that that I look at that enzyme. I look at the genetics. And if you've got a a dysfunctional enzyme, you're not going to clear aluminum that well. So I'm going to tell you, hey, look you should, shouldn't cook with aluminum foil, you know, something real simple like that, real actionable. That's kind of the stuff I would focus on. So I look at a huge panel of detox genes and try and figure out, you know, what kind of chemicals you should be hyper vigilant about avoiding. And everybody is just, you know, responded really just there. The the feedback I get when I do people's DNA has been really positive. Yeah, and what are some of the the things you're looking for on the performance side? You said like you know sometimes it's high intensity interval training, sometimes it's powerlifting endurance. Um, what kind of uh, what are we, what are you looking for there? And uh, have you ever had given a recommendation? Maybe someone's in a sport where they their genes say they they shouldn't be. Yeah, I mean it's a tough spot to be in. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I somebody just I was doing a. Brent Porsau's DNA and we were recording it on Skype. So it's going to be a public conversation. Normally I, everything's confidential, but sometimes I do DNA analysis on somebody's podcast or something like that. And he asked me the same question because people come to him as pitchers and they want to become professional pitchers to throw 90 miles an hour or whatever. And, and what happens if their DNA comes back and sh- sh- indicates that <laughs> they're not really built, they're not cut out to be a, you know, a high velocity thrower or something. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough one because, you know, you can overcome a lot of things. I think the key though, is just to know, just the knowledge, just knowing where you're optimal and trying to optimize that. You know, I mean, some people like to try and bolster their weaknesses, but I think it's better to try and bolster the things that you're already good at and become really exceptional in those areas. But yeah, if you're, you know, like a good example with the pitching is Justin Verlander, I think. I've never done his DNA, and so I'm just speculating here. But my guess is he's an endurance guy, and you know, he pitches unbelievable. He's had longevity in his career. He throws in the in the ninety, you know, mid to high ninety mile an hour range. And as the game goes on, 
he gets better and better and better. So he's learned that, you know, even though he's an endurance guy, he can still, you know, perform at this really high level with per- with the unbelievably good form that he has as a pitcher. And he just needs more warm up time. So he, I think he's adapted well to his genetics, but he's probably not a fast twitch, you know, alpha actinin, you know, uh, just power lifting type of a profile genetically. That's my guess again, but so you, you can, you can make it work, but you know, it's better if you just, like I say, it's better if you're optimizing things that you're genetically optimal for. And have you run across any, um, I don't know, I guess I'd call it like a hybrid athlete, someone who, you know, maybe is kind of could be responsive in, in all areas or people normally have kind of one dominant domain that they, their body or DNA says that they should be training. No, I think, I actually think most people are hybrid and it's hard to put an exact percentage, but I kind of try when I do people's DNA and, uh, you know, you can do the, you have to kind of factor in a lot of different things, but I, yeah, definitely most people are hybrid. They're, they're tend, they tend towards endurance or power, you know, or something like that. But yeah, actually most people are hybrid. Okay. Very cool. And, and what exactly are you looking at, uh, in someone's DNA to determ- make these determinations? So we look at the, the main thing is I use 23andMe data for the most part. And what they're doing, this company 23andMe, um, they're looking at something called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are abbreviated SNP, like SNP. We just pronounce it SNP. And uh, those SNPs are really powerful. Be- you know, for example, um, yeah, what's the disease called with the red blood cell? So sickle cell anemia, right? Mm-hmm. You've heard of this? Yes. Um, so if you've got sickle cell anemia, red blood cells, you know, can become like sickle shaped instead of donut shaped and they don't transport oxygen well throughout your blood and sickle cell anemia, that disease, which can be real debilitating, um, that's due to one, that can be due to one single nucleotide polymorphism, one single little DNA change, one SNP change and boom, you've got, you know, you've got sickle cell and you, so what I, you know, as scientists, we're looking for those things. And I've got a lot of research on a lot of different areas looking for the big, you know, the single nucleotide polymorph, the SNPs that are impacting people's health. And again, in real practical ways is kind of my focus. I think people get too academic about it and try, you know, and, and too complicated and give you like these 50 page reports, you know, but I'm just looking for the things that are real practical that people can change to improve, you know, to make improvements, but it's always based on SNPs. That's very cool. And, and uh, you mentioned some of the things being like not cooking with uh, aluminum foil. What are some other like uh, interesting things you, you've uh, recommended to athletes since you've been doing this? Yeah. A big one is the MTHFR gene. Um, a lot of people have heard of it. I don't know if you've heard of this one. Mm-hmm. Um, it stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase. So that's why we call it MTHFR, but methylene tetrahydrofolate. So folate is, you know, is, uh, obviously a B vitamin really critical for making DNA. It's actually a DNA precursor. So when a, when a woman is pregnant, for example, the fetus is rapidly, rapidly dividing, making new cells. So you need a lot, a lot of new DNA and where do you get new DNA? Your body can make it or the fetus's cells can make it from full, you know, methylfolate from folates. And so a lot of doctors, of course, when you get pregnant or when you're thinking about getting pregnant, even because your body stores this stuff, um, they tell you, yeah, supplement folic acid. But if you've got this gene, uh, issue with methyl folate, with, with this MTHFR gene, it's actually worse to supplement folic acid. You want to be supplementing folate like five MTHF or something. If you were to go on Amazon and type in five MTHF, um, you'll find methylfolates and those are ready to go. You know, your body can use those. Whereas folic acid is a fake chemistry molecule that was designed in a lab and patented at one point. And your body has to convert that to methylfolate in order to use it. And so you don't really find it in nature. You don't, you, you find a methylfolate when you eat raspberries or when you eat spinach or whatever, you get methylfolate, which is ready to go. You don't get folic acid. So that's one, a good example of a a genetic issue that a ton of people have. I would say over 50% of people have some issue with their methylfolate gene. And those are the same people that oftentimes have food sensitivities to all the grains and, 
you know, all these enriched products that have folic acid. So on top of the mold issues in the grains, on top of the atrazine and the herbicides, you know, now you're throwing folic acid at people. And I mean, there's so many issues, but that's just one example. Yeah. And that's, and what is the, uh, I may have missed it, but is the, the fix there is supplementation with either just straight folate or if you need it, methylfolate? Correct. Yeah. You, you definitely want to supplement. I mean, you can, if you're eating spinach or something with folate, you know, regularly, you don't need to supplement, but yeah, most of the time, I think the biggest fix is to eliminate folic acid, stop eating it. Because what happens is if you spike your blood with folic acid and your body's not able to use it, you actually end up blocking the receptors for methylfolate. So say you're eating some spinach, which should be ideal, right? Because it's got methylfolate, but then you're supplementing folic acid at the same time. Yeah. So then you have this huge level of folic acid floating around your blood, binding those receptors, but then they can't be, it can't be utilized. So it's actually plugging the receptors and not allowing methylfolate to be used. And so you're actually creating a bigger problem. So I think it goes back to avoidance again. You know, it's like this idea that avoiding what you avoid in your diet these days, at least in modern society, what you avoid is more important than what you're putting in. That's very fascinating. And so if uh, someone is deficient, the, fixing this, you said could fix like food sensitivities and things that a lot of people struggle with. Yeah, it helps. I mean, certainly because again, you're avoiding stuff. So <laughs> You know, yeah, it, 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 it's usually not the, the only cause of food right. sensitivities and, but it's certainly, it's a big one, you know, and the irony of doing high performance genetics, um, with people that are athletes and pro athletes and this, I, I, I usually see the DNA of those people and, and find very few detox gene issues, very few issues. And uh, these, some of these genes we're talking about. And there, of course, there's there's a hundred other ones, you know. But I, it's amazing how few issues that these guys have. And so what they got, oftentimes they got the good end of the genetic spectrum, and so they're kind of um, quote unquote immune to a lot of these problems. And so that they, they almost, you know, disdain the idea that we people have food sensitivities or whatever. They think it's just a weakness, but that's because they happen to have really good genetics. And so they can kind of eat whatever they want or get away with a lot more things. But, you know, what I'm more interested in are the people that struggle and they want to excel and they have a few genetic issues. And then we work around those genetic issues and then take them up to a, a really high level. And that just might mean, you know, sometimes that's just an average person just wanting to, you know, have more energy or not be depressed or, you know what I mean? But in terms of athletics and using that analogy you know, you can, you don't have to have the, this, the great genetics to be a pro athlete, but you, you do need to be aware of the issues you have and work around them at least to get to that level. And would you say it's possible to work hard enough either through fitness nutrition to, uh, change your DNA or your genes? Like how I, I've just seen Good some, question. uh, very recently some, you know, topics and research coming up on this, but I want to talk to you about it. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I, I'm actually writing two books right now. One of them is on DNA, and then the other one's on epigenetics. And what you're kind of alluding to is epigenetics, because epigenetics are marks on top of your DNA. And that's also inherited, by the way. So that's super interesting, because, you know, what you eat, how you exercise, you know, the chemicals you're exposed to, that gets passed on to future generations through these marks on top of the DNA. So it doesn't really change your DNA unless it's some kind of a really nasty carcinogen or something that cuts up your DNA. But for the most part, your DNA doesn't really change, but these epigenetic marks do change. And so that, you know, that's a good argument for working out or eating right, you know, because you're not only affecting yourself, but you're literally impacting future generations. And that's one of the reasons our health, I think, is declining is people, they weren't factoring this epigenetic component in and you know, a lot of what our parents have done in their diets is now impacting this generation and it's impacting the next generation for the worse um, because these things get, you know, they, they get exacerbated in future generations. And, and, and one of the things about working out I wanted to add was that, you know, 
when you're lifting properly for your own genetics, so say you're doing, like I say, most people's genetics, they should be powerlifting. They should be doing deadlifts. They should be doing squats. They should be doing, you know, heavy, heavy weights, um, with good form, obviously. But you know, that's, that's usually what people, that's the category people fall into genetically. Um, and that can make up for a lot of dietary shenanigans. So if you're, if you're exercising, you're moving, you're working out, you can eat, you don't have to nail the diet quite as perfectly because your body will clear things a lot better. It'll handle things a lot better. Um, and so, you know, that's a good argument also, again, for doing the stuff that you guys do and promote because you can get away with other things. You don't have to be quite so pristine in your diet. You know, I, and I, I think this is a, an awesome topic to, to cover because not only does it yeah, you know, kind of further my purpose and, and what I, I tell people to do in, in the, in the gym and in their garages and stuff is, you know, lifting heavy weights. Uh, but the fact that it, it's almost a cop out to me sometimes when we talk to other coaches who want to say, you know, nutrition is 90% of it. And then, you know, training is 10% of it. And, I've never maybe maybe partially due to bias because I really enjoy training and, and helping people see results in that regard. But I feel like there it, it's way more intertwined than that. And now what you're talking about it on the on the genetic or epigenetic level, you, this is where we kind of see it come to life. Is like you, yeah, you need the if you want to lose weight or something, nutrition is going to be very important. But uh, for your body just to function differently or properly, you need to have you need to be serious about fitness it can't just be this uh you know 10,000 steps a day if you want some senior, serious changes in your life it has to be a little bit more dramatic than that uh would is that something you'd agree with oh for sure and one of the reasons that's true is because it changes your hormones across the board and these are the same hormones we were talking about before and they can they have such global changes <laughs> excuse me i have a little bit of a cold but <laughs> but um you know massive changes directly in mark changing the marks on your DNA. And that's why epigenetics is su such an important thing to consider because, you know, if you've got a genetic issue with an enzyme, you know, so it's not detoxing aluminum perfectly, or it's not detoxing mold toxins, I, you know, perfectly or whatever, you're always going to have that issue. You know what I mean? But, but if you've got an epigenetic issue, that, that changes the amount of that enzyme that's made. So you'll make more, you know, uh, aluminum breakdown enzyme or whatever. But, and you can change that. I mean, I think in the future, we're going to have tests that you can actually show how much of, you know, if you can sh look at your epigenetics, kind of like 23andMe, except for instead of DNA, it's epigenetics. And we'll be able to track that through our exercise and through our diet. And we'll be able to see those changes. And people will realize that heavy lifting will just have such a positive benefit and, and it's so much more efficient for them for most people in terms of metabolic changes and optimizing hormones you know heavy lifting is just far superior and it changes multiple you know like i say multiple generations but it's probably immediate too all right so two questions and first when does your book come out on epigenetics i'm going to try and put those ones out at the same time so i want the dna and the epigenetic one out and I honestly don't know. I, I was hoping, you know, within the next six months and that might still come out and that it might still be true, but I'm spending so much time at the Mayo Clinic doing so many different things. Um, I'm, I can't make any promises, but hopefully in, within the next year. Okay. Very cool. I definitely, uh, am going to, going to pick up a copy of that now too. What is the, the process of looking at, how would you, I, I'm guessing 23andMe doesn't do that the epigenetics. Like how, how would we take a look at your epigenetics right now? Yeah, right now you can only do it in research labs. So what we do in our lab, for example, is we do some something called bisulfite sequencing. And that just looks at methylation changes on DNA. So, you know, it's it's complicated, it's expensive. You know, one of the beauties of DNA is that there's so much research that's been done on it. It's comparing huge populations of people and you can look at one change and how that affects people. And you've got massive numbers of people that have had their DNA, millions, literally millions of people that have had their DNA done. And you can see what, you know, how the DNA changes have health impacts. But with epigenetics, you can't really do that because the sheer number of studies haven't been done. So right now, you know, you can't really look at your epigenetics 
unless you're in a research lab. Okay. Well, very cool to know that this is kind of some emerging uh, research, and I'm I'm excited for your your book to come out, and I, I really uh, love going down this rabbit hole. Um, now, you know, we're, I don't want to run out of time, so one question I'd like to ask, especially with someone of your ca- caliber, you know, is there any topic or area or question I should have asked that I haven't asked or something that you, you would like to, to cover that maybe I've missed? No, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I could think of a hundred things, but yeah, you know, it's, there's so much, there's, there's so many different areas you can take this stuff. I mean, you know, one of the things I think is, is the difference between total testosterone and free testosterone and how these estrogens, you know, they lower your total testosterone, which is one thing, but they also lower your, lower your free testosterone, which is how it acts in your body. I mean, that's something that, you know, we could probably dive way too deep on and and start to lose people. But, uh, you know, that's an interesting rabbit hole in and of itself. Well, then I'm thinking maybe down the road that we have, maybe the the release of your second book would be a good time for that too, is, uh, you know, Dr. J part two on the better humanology podcast. That would be awesome. Yeah. We could even do your DNA or something, you know? Oh, that would be, get your 23 and me done and do that on the air. That that's, that's really fun. That would be fun. (laughs) All right, so let's move to the quick fire questions of the show. Uh, what's the hardest workout you've ever done? Um, honestly, I think deadlifting in and of itself transformed my life. I, I was, I got allergies when I started doing my PhD and acid reflux, a bunch of silly health issues that, you know, like I shouldn't have gotten, but I had stopped working out completely because I was, you know, stressed and I was studying so many hours, and then I. I realized I need to get into the gym and slowly and I, and I learned about deadlifting and that just, you know, totally changed my, my health. But, um, the hardest workouts I've done have been when I, when I pushed up towards 500 pounds and tried to (laughs) like deadlift, I do five rep, I do five reps, one by five. So one set of five reps is kind of the, the, I don't, I never do one rep max type stuff, but Boy, the, some of those five, some of those five repetitions of heavy, heavy deadlifts. That's probably the hardest I've ever done. I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not like, you know, <laughs> really, I'm not exceptional in the weight room, but that's where it's at for me. No, that's awesome. And your love of the deadlift uh, is inspiring. I absolutely love it. All right. All right. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? Um, you know. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of the science on cold therapy, cryotherapy in terms of, I mean, well, cryo is different than icing, you know, like sitting in an ice bath. Yeah. It's not as beneficial as most people think in terms of their health and inflammatory markers and because it, number one, it lowers your testosterone, but it's super beneficial for your mental toughness. And there's something to be said for that as long as you're not overdoing it all the time. So you, you don't get that testosterone drop. Um, so that's one thing. And, and the other thing is the sauna, which, you know, it has no impact or it increases your testosterone. So I, I love the sauna. I mean, there's, there's way more science on the sauna beneficial showing beneficial things and health positive, you know, positive health impacts. So between those two, I would, I would go for the sauna, but you know, or cold showers, you talk about mental toughness. I mean, <laughs> you can't go wrong. And, and what kind of uh, sauna would you recommend? There are a lot of different options between uh, wet, dry, red light, you know, all the different things that you could uh, you could do. What, what uh, sauna would you recommend? Yeah, most of the athletes I had talked to, they're going into infrared because uh, infrared by itself imitates exercise in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it frees up nitric oxide and allows your body to make ATP. And I mean, it has all these benefits. And most of the time, if you look up the research on it, you don't find much. And you have to look up the term low-level laser light therapy, which is ridiculous. But that's how scientists have – that's what scientists have called infrared mm-hmm. for for like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a ton of research on it, but most people aren't able to find it until they until they recognize, oh, that's what I got to search. I got to search low-level laser light therapy. And I, I'm a big fan of the infrared. But honestly, whatever you can get your hands on consistently, as long as it's a couple times a week – you know, if it's a heat sauna, if it's infrared, you know, either way. And the benefits come primarily from the the actual 
wavelengths of the light, correct? Is it, is it important that you sweat? What do you, where do you think the main benefit comes from? Yeah, no, I think the heat is really important. Okay. But it's, it's completely separate from the infrared benefits, which are exactly what you said. They're the specific wavelengths in like the 680 nanometer range, 660. And yeah, so infrared has biologic impacts that are really different than just heat. And that's one of the reasons I like it because you can do both with infrared. You can have the heat therapy and the infrared wavelengths and then you're just maximizing your time. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I started using infrared from uh, a company called Juve. Yeah. Um, he actually, he actually sent me the infrared light because I, I, he's a Minnesota guy and I called him and talked to him and I, I guess he just moved to, uh, his name is Scott Nelson, but he just moved out to California and uh, I'm, I'm literally putting shining infrared light on uh, stem cells. So I'm taking stem cells out of patients, humans, out of their fat, and then growing them in dishes and cells and I'm, uh, in, in cell dishes. And then I'm using this juve light on top of the cells and trying to reprogram the stem cells so that when we inject them back into people's joints, um, it's actually more beneficial. So really interesting stuff. And I can't believe how nobody's talking about this, the really in-depth science on infrared, but it's out there. Yeah. It's, uh, all the non-scientists who are, who are talking about it and that's why no one really believes them. So we, yeah, we, yeah. we, we need people like you to keep doing the work that you're doing where everyone else will believe, uh, you know, all the health benefits of some of the stuff that, uh, people are, are supporting out there. Yeah. All right, man. So if you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Barbell for sure. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> get that deadlift done. Yeah. Yeah. I call, I, I have what I call the big six, which is a deadlift and a squat, which is push pull with your legs and then the bench press and the row. And that's a bent over row, like a pendle row. That's push pull with your you know upper body. And then you got the overhead press and then the pull down. That's what I call the big six. And that should be the foundation of everybody's strength, in my opinion, where you can build on that and do a lot of other things. But, you know, if you're a total beginner, I like to see people doing the big six and that's all with the barbell. I couldn't agree more. I think that's awesome. All right. Now, the question of the show, what is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? This is 100% open-ended. Well, there's so many things, right? I mean, <clears throat> just just to stick with kind of the theme, I think people should avoid artificial estrogen and because it's so overlooked and it's 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 not as extreme as it sounds, you know? Like people sometimes read my book and then they say, like, oh, Anthony is recommending, you know, like we throw everything out and so, some people need to do that. But, you know, once you get used to avoiding soy and, and, and not rubbing these chemicals on your skin, you know, you, once you change your shampoos and your soaps, it's easy because you just keep getting good quality stuff and it doesn't have to be expensive stuff. So I think that should be that's probably the one thing a lot of people aren't going to say, but that's my focus. And I see a lot of benefits from people in terms of fertility. I see, I see testosterone just totally changing. You know, I get a lot of really good uh, testimonials on this stuff and I think it should be spread around. Other people should be doing that too. Awesome. All right. Now I know a lot of people are going to want to maybe check out your book, check out your website. So what's the best place for people to learn more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, I think AJ Consulting Company, um, which is my website is probably the best place. And speaking of t products, I don't I don't have any endorsements. I don't get money from companies um, because I don't really need to. But and I don't want that bias. But I have on my website it's ajconsultingcompany.com uh, slash what I use. That's all one word. What I use, and that just shows the soaps, the sunscreen stuff like that that I that I personally use. It doesn't. It's not an exhaustive list of every company that's awesome because there's a lot of good ones, but you know, if people are interested, they should at least check that out and get a sense of, you know, a good, some of the stuff to avoid personal care product, artificial estrogens. That's incredibly helpful. So I will definitely link to that in the show notes and everyone listening, go check it out. I know I'm going to check it out myself. Well, Dr. J, it's been a blast uh, having you on the podcast. I really appreciate your time. Uh, thanks for, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Jared.
best. Losers always whine about their best. <laughs>